What's up, everybody? Take your seats, please. <laughs> oh, there you are. Perfect. So there you are. Thank you, sir. What's up, everybody? How are you? Good night. Great night. Amazing night. Yeah. Thank you, too. <laughs> Um, 10,544, two point, uh, million dollar gate, 2.2 .2 million dollar gate. Here are the bonuses. Uh, the fight of the night goes to Kennedy and Romero. Oh, I know. I know. You'll do all right. Don't worry. Performance of the night, uh, was McGregor and Cruz. So congratulations to them. They won $50,000 each. Everybody will be here in a minute. Who's got the first question? Uh-oh. These two. Let's start with Dominic, if we could, actually, please. Dominic, um, obviously a fantastic win for you tonight. Now you had a little chance to reflect. You know, can you tell us what the win really meant for you tonight? And also, you said you blacked out. Don't really remember what happened. Is that typical, or was that just because the emotions were running so high tonight? It's pretty typical, to be honest. I usually just kind of try to go on muscle memory, a lot of drilling. But uh, the win for me tonight was just about, you know, my own goal, my own set of goals. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know how I was going to feel after three years. I didn't know what the lights were going to do. I didn't know what being there was going to do, and I just had to go in there and do it, and it was big for me. Dane, if I could ask you, how do you see the 135-pound title picture right now? Because obviously, you know, Sun Xiao was kind of number one. He's got a fight next week, uh, mm -hmm. but Cruz never lost. And it seems like public sentiment is saying they'd love to see it. So how do you see the title picture right now? Nobody does that to Mizugaki. Nobody. And he didn't lose his belt uh, in fighting. He's the unluckiest man on earth. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, he's, he's the guy. So it'll be him and Dillashaw next? Um, yeah. Sweet. Any target yet? Any, any no. idea? Fantastic. No. Yeah, I worked out all the dates tonight in the back, and uh, the answer is no. <laughs> Fair enough. Let me ask you as well. Um, obviously, everybody's talking about the, the Kennedy and Yoel Romero fight. Uh, I saw you. It looked like you had an extended conversation with um, mm. with the commission at one point in the night. Can you tell us what you saw and, and, and what they informed you? Well, any of you guys that have followed the sport for a long time or have been involved in the sport for a long time, it's the dirtiest trick in the book. Literally the dirtiest trick in the book. And But I, I will say this. The Vaseline, you know, what you do is you put on way too much Vaseline. You slow everything down. You don't take the guys out of the corner, all this stuff. It, it, you, everybody's seen it happen many, many times. The Angelo Dundee cuts the glove thing, you know. Kevin, I'm getting to that. I'm getting to that. Where it isn't, where where it isn't come off. The, it was our guy, the the UFC cut man that put that put the the Vaseline on his eye. So that's what throws the whole wrinkle in it. And, and the thing is, the athletic. And then the, then you have a uh, language barrier. You know, there was nobody in the corner that spake. But I saw the guys from the commission. They were right in front of you. He was screaming, get the hell out of here. I don't care what language you speak. You know what get the hell out of here means. You know what time you're supposed to be out of the, out of the octagon. You know how much time you had. Um, but to be fair to him and his corner men, it was our guy who globbed all that Vaseline on his eye. So really weird situation. Extremely controversial. And a uh, little story. Many of you were probably there at K1. I actually bet a bunch of money on Kimbo, uh, uh, I mean Kimo, on Kimo in the uh, Bob Sapp fight. And Bob Sapp gets knocked out at the end of the first round. He's out. He's done. They carry him over to the corner where they work on him for about two and a half minutes. And then he comes out and knocks out uh, Kimo in the next round. So I've, I've experienced it. You know, I've been on that side, you know, as a fan there watching the fights and seeing it too. It's, uh, it's a tough one. Huh? I lost, no, it's not what I lost. It wasn't that I lost a lot. It's what you would have won if, if, if Kimo won the fight. That was the, that was the crazy part. Not, not much. I didn't bet that much. I wasn't that confident in Kimo. Uh, fair enough. And, Kat, if I could just ask you, obviously, um, but before this fight, Dana had said that if you win, you get the top shot. It looked like January 3rd was the date. You, you went through a hell of a fight tonight. Um, do you think you'll be ready by January 3rd? Is that a date you can fight by? Yeah, I was uh, really, really pushing to just get through this fight, and I knew breaking this barrier would would mean 
showing my face a lot more. I just had to get through this one, you know, and then I could look at the horizon, but th this was very focused for me. And Dana, I mean, is that fight official at this point? I mean, you had said that was the fight, yes. that was the date. Yeah, she's it. She, you know, that was, that, this is what I'm assuming. You guys probably didn't hear it when she was screaming at me after the fight. She ran over, started screaming, do you see me? Do you see me? Yes, I see you. Um, and this was the shut up about Gina Carano fight, I think. I, th I think that's what Kat, the statement she wanted to make tonight. And uh, she made it loud and clear. She's been away for a while. She had some injuries. She was dealing with some personal problems. She is back. I think that the fans needed to see her. And, and she needed to remind everybody why she was in line for a title fight. And she did it tonight. And last question I have, obviously, Donald. Uh, four of your six that you wanted this year, but it seems like you might be in a position to be a number one contender. There's a title fight in December. Um, what's your plan? I mean, do you want to try to stay busy and get another fight in, or do you want to do you want to say, hey, I'm, I'm number one, give me this title fight? Well, he's got a wakeboarding trip coming up next week. Uh, when he's done doing that, he'll he'll give us a call and let let us know when he's available. Yeah, there you <laughs> go. I uh, of course want to stay very busy, so. Taking a fight in November, December would be great for me. You know, waiting, I don't know. I don't know. I want to fight. The pimp is here. Question for Yoel. Uh, Yoel, can you talk, first of all, how badly were you hurt at the end of the first round? ¿Cómo te dolió en el primer round? En el segundo round, cuando te dio el piñazo. You know, it's, it's the punch in the face. <laughs> when somebody pushes the face, sometimes you a little bad. But I can go in the fight. But not too bad. So do you think the extra time with wiping the Vaseline and all the stuff that went on, you got to sit on the stool a lot longer than you normally would have? 30, 35 seconds, some people were estimating. Do you think that that helped you recover more quickly? ¿Tú piensas que el extra tiempo que tú tenías en ese 130 segundos, 20 segundos más que debes tener, te ayudó a recoger más rápido? And it was 28 seconds. 28 seconds. 20, 28. Maybe. I don't know. Do you, Dana, do you think then it's deserving for Tim Kennedy to get a rematch on that situation? If it, you know, it was a really good fight, uh, Kennedy was in command at the end of the first round, and then he loses the fight based on, you know, crazy circumstances. Right. And, and that's what I was saying. I mean, like I said, everybody knows that that's, that that's an old trick, an old dirty trick. But the, the thing that throws the kink in the whole thing is it was our guy that put the Vaseline on. So there was nobody, you know, trying to take advantage. And they called his guy back in to wipe the Vaseline off. He didn't understand what they were saying. Wipe in the back. Yeah, huh? yeah, exactly. So, it, you know, it, it's, it's very unfortunate. And, uh, you know, it's an odd thing that, that, that absolutely never happens. Uh, who knows? I mean, I, I would have to see how, how he feels, how I'm sure Kennedy wants a rematch. But, you know, you can't take anything away from the guys. It was, a, it was an awesome fight. And, and if I'm – Connor, can I ask you, uh, the closing sequence, you know, the, the punch, the left hand that you landed, looked like maybe your elbow hit him on the side of the head. Did, did the fist land with a punch, and then did you hit him with the elbow somewhere? And if so, do you know where you got him? Um, look a little closer because it was a left hook that clipped him above the ear and to hit a guy above the ear and to the back that as long as it doesn't go right back if it's above the ear and here if it's above the ear but behind the ear that's a clean blow uh, I had a discussion with Herb Dean right before the contest happened um, so it was a clean blow but I would have liked him to connect with the chain I would have liked him to connect cleaner but there's so much soft beautiful tissue there that if you crack that little soft area there's no coming back from that so um, look a little closer. It was a legal shot, um, and that was that. Did you see that, Dana? What, what did you think? Because you had a better view than we did. We were on the other side of the cage. Yeah, right? no, I, I, it looked legal to me too. Did you think? The, did the fist land at all, Connor? Did at you at no point did I get up and go, "Oh man, that, that was to the back of the head." Did did, it, did you did the contact come with your elbow or no. your fist? No, it was the it was the fist. I fell into it a little bit, to be honest. Looking back, I didn't like it. I double double jabbed and. F I kind of fell into the left hook a little bit. The first, I threw one before that where I just let the left hook ping. And my, I didn't move my body too much, but it just cracked him. That was the one that hurt him. But the one that finished him, I fell into a little bit. But it hit him with the fist at the back of the head but above the ear, which is a legal blow. 
Um, at the end of the day, it was a clean shot, and, and that was that. For me, I don't like the way people look at the referee. You know, like, he didn't get up and complain. He knew it was a clean shot. If I got knocked out that way, I wouldn't be up here saying it was a illegal blow. I would I would recognize I was knocked out, and that was that. So Did Dustin say anything to you, either in the ring or in the back? Uh, no, in, in in the ring he was humble. You know, Dustin is a good is a good kid. Um, I had no ill feelings towards Dustin. It, it it was weird to me that he was like, I've never hated a guy as much as I hate this guy in my life, or or something like that. He said, to me that is weird. I cannot hate a man that has the same dreams as me. I, you know, I have no emotion to them at the end of the day. I am on my journey. Um, so he's a humble guy. He came to fight, and I have nothing but respect for these competitors. Make no mistake, I am cocky. In prediction, I am confident in preparation, but I am always humble in victory or defeat. So I am I am humble here, and I am grateful for the opportunity that the UFC, Dana and Lorenzo, Uncle Frank the Fourth, have given me. I am grateful. A uh, question for Dominic Cruz. Uh, Dominic, it was mentioned uh, earlier to your right. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, Takei Muzagaki, win or lose, a lot of times goes to decision. He never uh, never finished that quickly. Was there anything you saw in your preparation that uh, led you to believe that, that you might have a shot at a finish that early? You know, uh, I just knew that – I knew his weapons. I knew his set of tools. I studied him. I understand the sport. I understand the things that he brings to the table. He's basically a shoot boxer that's extremely durable and extremely tough. So I knew I had a lot more weapons than him and I could use them. I also knew that he was going to have a hard time finding me. The only thing I didn't know was how hard he was going to come at me. He had a choice. He could either stay on the outside and try to wait for me and let me pick up my rhythm and my feints and my timing, or he could try to rush me and catch me off guard and get me moving back. Well, depending on what you do, I make adjustments during the fight. I made the adjustment. He crawled to the fence, and doing that, you have no defense when you're crawling to the fence. That allowed me to slip some punches in and get the finish. I'm grateful for the finish. A question for Conor McGregor. Uh, Conor, tonight you took out the UFC's number five ranked fighter. Uh, so above that, that would leave either the winner of uh, Aldo and Mendez or uh, Cub Swanson and Frankie Edgar. Uh, obviously, um, you're, you've arrived. Is anything short of a title shot something you consider at this point if they offered you uh, the winner of uh, Cub and Frankie? Um, we don't, you know, at the end of the day, as long as I show up and my check is what it says it's going to be, then I show up and I will kill whoever they put in front of me. Of course I want that gold belt. Don't try and tell me that that gold belt sitting up right there on this table would not look great to go alongside this ivory elephant trunk suit that I have got on me right now. It would look perfect. I know Dana wants to see it. I know Lorenzo wants to see it. Shout out to Uncle Frank. I know he wants to see it. It's what the fans want. It's what I want. It's what I said. I said I was going to put him away in one round. No one's ever knocked him out. No one has ever done that to Dustin before. He's a great guy. I have nothing but respect for him. I don't just knock him out. I also picked a round. For uh, Kat Zingano, uh, Kat, uh, obviously we know what's next for you with a title shot. Uh, what do you anticipate from your skill set uh, being more of a challenge to Ronda Rousey than she's faced before? What, what do you think you'll uh, uh, bring to a title shot with Ronda that she, she hasn't faced before? Um, I, I just think the caliber of, of athlete, you know, the intensity that I bring, um, I feel like I'm – uh, I'm. I don't know. I I don't have. I. I just bring something different to everything. Um, I'm. I'm just game. And finally, for Dana, uh, in reference to the uh, Kennedy Romero fight, and I know this is going to be reviewed, but you were talking about the UFC's corner man and the the Vaseline. Does the stool play into this at all? Uh, for example, who is responsible ultimately for the custody of the stool? Because I would assume when Romero was left on the stool, his corner men exit. It's like leaving a piece of equipment in the octagon. Does that factor in at all? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. I mean, I mean, and in, in, in this situation too, there was a lot more than just a. There, there was a, a lot of water. There was a lot of Vaseline. The stool was left in there. 
And is there a chain of command on that stool? I mean, is there any, is the discussion ever been had that that's the responsibility of the corner or the UFC? I mean, if you if you're a corner man, you know you're supposed to be, you know, um, well versed in what goes on, how much time you have with the guy. Um, somebody takes the stool out, other guys got the water and all the other stuff. Um, you know, and, and and the athletic commissioner was screaming at him to get that stuff out of there, and the stool was left, but. You can't pick up the stool if the guy's still sitting on it. Who's going to pick up the stool if the guy's still sitting on the stool? But you're saying that's ultimately the responsible, responsibility of the corner, yeah. the stool. Absolutely. Who else would it be the responsibility of? The referee? It's the, it's the corner man. He's in? He's all in? Okay, great. Uh, I have a question for you, Cowboy. You said after the fight that you believe you're cursed to have a, a slow first round. Um, what's that about? Why do you think that is? Is it something about you? You need a little bit of adrenaline going to your system or, you know, what is that? I have no idea. I wish I could figure it out because God damn, I take some punishment sometimes. So, uh, if I could figure it out, that'd be great. But, uh, going out there and taking, I don't even know, maybe 15, 16 unanswered punches there was there. I, so, uh, all I could think is not today, motherfucker. That's all that was going through my head. So, uh, other than that, I, I, I don't know if it's a curse or just, I don't know what it is, but someday I'll figure it out, or maybe that's just who I am. I don't know. And are you aware of, of the doubters, the, the cowboy doubters that say when when it comes time for a big fight, you don't come through? Oh, yeah. I used to doubt myself in the same thing, but not anymore. I mean, that I, I used to be on that same train, like, man, I'm fighting the best in the world. Like, oh, shit. But I don't know. Just believing in myself lately and wakeboarding and shit. <laughs> Uh, and Kat, I have a question for you. Obviously, uh, you've had an incredibly tough year. I was just wondering if you had any fears, any sort of adrenaline dump before coming out tonight because there was so much writing, you, you know, so much pressure on this for you to have a great performance tonight, obviously with the title shot on the line and just the difficulties that you've had in the past year. Yeah, for sure. You know, but I'm not going to let that be an excuse. I performed the way I performed tonight. It doesn't matter. I This was a choice to take this fight. And with all the risks involved, I, I showed up and I fought the way I fought, so I don't have excuses. You know, I, it, it is what it is. That's how it went. And Dominic, same question for you basically about the adrenaline dump. I know you uh, spent a lot of time mentally preparing for things, but I have to believe a little bit backstage it was probably a little, a little anxiousness going on. So what's the question really? <laughs> Did you have any sort of adrenaline dump before you came out tonight? No, I felt, I felt like I've done this over 20 times, you know. I've I was ready for it. I believe I'm the best in the world. So I went out there and just did my job. Surprisingly, once I got there and saw the little piece of tape with my name on it, I actually felt more calm. Once I heard my song, I felt better. Um, I was probably more nervous all day waiting at the hotel room before I even walked to the arena than I was once I got there. Once I got there and I saw the fighters around me and I was in the room with Kennedy and Cerrone and everybody and I just see them, it like brought peace to me. It like... I felt like I was at home, and it was nice to be away from the desk. And do you feel like you're better than ever, or do you feel like the quote-unquote old dominant? I'm far from the old dominant. A lot of things are better. You know, nothing's worse. I'm, I'm ready to be back, and I'm ready to have that belt. Thanks. A few more for Connor, please. Um, Connor, I mean, we hear guys all the time say they're getting better with every fight, every time they step in there, but, I mean, it really seems true with you. What, what's been the key to that? What, what have you figured out that's making you have better performance every time? Um, I just put the work in, you know, I don't, I don't slack off 365 days a year, 24 seven. Um, I'm, I, I'm getting better. You know, that, that's what it's about. This game is about growth. I find that a lot of mixed martial artists or a lot of athletes period get to a stage where they are happy with their ability. And then it's about maintenance. It's about showing up at the gym. It's about getting hard rounds in. it's about getting miles on the road in, but really their skill level is not growing. Their, the skill level is staying the same, and then throughout time, their body is deteriorating. Throughout wars in the gym, throughout wars in the octagon, they deteriorate. As I feel, I train smart, um, I listen to my body, and this is only my second fight back, back from ACL. It's been under a year since ACL surgery. I've had two fights, two first-round finishes. Would you doubt me? You probably did, but would you doubt me now? 
uh, and also before the fight, uh, we heard you talk a lot about going to Brazil and that, you know, you were hoping to be ready in case there was an injury. And you mentioned it again after the fight. Is that the plan? I mean, are you going to stay in shape these next few weeks just in case something happens? Am you're damn right. As long as there's money on the line, I show up in shape. You best believe that. Uh, and lastly, you said the uh, belt would look really good in front of you. Well, we heard you were carrying around the belt after the fight. What happened to it? Um, the belt, they left the belt hanging there somewhere uh, just in front of the Fox Studios and I said, or in the Fox Sports 1 lot, or the UFC on Fox thing. And I picked it up and brought it on stage. And I was sitting, it's funny, right, because I was sitting, after the weigh-ins, they brought me onto that stage as well. And I was rehyd or dehydrated. I was rehydrating myself. But I had to do this interview, push the show, pu push the numbers again, professional inside, professional outside. That's what I like to say. But anyway, I was sitting there in a vest top, a pair of shades, and Rashad... Uh, Brian Stan and John Anik were standing there and I'm telling and they're all saying it's going to be a tough fight I'm saying it's not going to be a tough fight I'm going to make it look easy I'm going to stop him in the first round and in the corner of my eye I can see, I can see Rashad looking at me like what's this uh, what's this crazy Irish motherfucker saying he, he's not you know what I mean I could sense doubt in him so when I when they offered me to go up again I went up this elephant trunk ivory suit Saw the belt, picked up the belt, put it on the table, and said, "Now what, Rashad? I know, I know you were doubting me. I know you doubted me, and and that was that. He 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 agreed. He was doubting me. He didn't he didn't believe the hype, as he said. But it's beautiful for me. I love this. I love proving people wrong and proving my support right. That's what it's about at the end of the day. You know, this is this is all fun and games to me. I love it. I love my job. I whoop people for truckloads of cash." How could I hate this life? I love it so much. I am grateful every single day. Thanks. Um, Dana, I um, asked you on uh, Thursday, Friday at the weigh-in about the, the, the strength of the card and the kind of, you know, whether it was a great card. It was uh, certainly the best card I think I've ever been at, frankly. And it was just amazing from top to bottom tonight. Um, was there a sense from you tonight that we were kind of, seeing an, an old school UFC card in some ways, if I can put it that way, if that means anything to you? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, we knew that tonight was a stack card with a ton of great fighters. Um, you know, usually in the locker rooms, after the weigh-ins, we go in and we, you know, I have a speech that I give everybody. I didn't say anything to these guys. I said, the hottest dudes in the world are on this card. You know, you know what to do. You know, and they all went in and they delivered. But... I, I I can't remember a card that I've gone to where I didn't feel that way, you know. I, you know, you'll have people who will who will uh, rip a card apart and everything else, like Sacramento. You talk about Sacramento. Sacramento was a great card. Yes, tonight had some good buzz and some energy, and 10% uh, of ticket sales came from Ireland. Can I so, ask you about that? You, yeah, you tweeted. You, you tweeted. You know, McGregor is legit, and obviously he is. It was a huge statement he made tonight. Huge statement. Um, I kept saying, you know, I kept saying, why is he, why is he predicting a first round knockout against the number five guy in the world? He's setting himself up for, you know, hey, I'm a believer. He, 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 he did exactly what he said he was going to do. You know, did I, did I think Connor was going to win tonight? I had no idea. Did I think he was actually going to go out and stop Poirier in the first round? I did not. Can you talk us through the extraordinary act that he did put on in that first round what was going through your head while you're watching him yeah th this whole conor mcgregor thing has been very fascinating to me I, I you know i went over to ireland um i received that award from trinity college i went to trinity college and literally all i heard was conor mcgregor the whole time that i was over there right conor mcgregor this conor mcgregor that so we came back here and i'm like who the hell is conor mcgregor who is this kid you know we heard, i said let's get this kid signed we signed him and uh, he came out to Las Vegas, and we, we went and ate, and then we hung out a little bit. I, call, I told Lorenzo, if this kid can fight this much, this much, if he can even throw a punch, this kid is going to be – So, and, and it's, it's bigger than anything I've ever seen before. It, you know, it, it's crazy. It's bigger than anything I've ever seen. And, and with respect to all the other fights on the card, because it was an extraordinary performance by many of you tonight, I just want to ask one more question about Connor and the Irish scenario is – would you, is there a chance that, given you know the, the the growth of MMA in Ireland, mainly through Connor at the moment, um, that a title fight could go to Europe, um, you know, with with the following he's got, or would it have to be over here if he fought for the title? Yeah, the answer is yes. It could go to Europe. Yeah, absolutely.
Thank you. Yep. A uh, question for Dana. Um, when Edgar and Swanson booked up the other day, and assuming Aldo beats Mendes, so we don't have to go through a trilogy, would it make sense almost to say, right, let's get Edgar and Swanson number one contendership and let Connor fight Aldo? And then I, I don't know. We'll see. A lot of things make sense. I could give you three other scenarios too. We'll see um, how this thing plays out. Just two quick ones for Connor. Uh, your coach John Kavanagh promoted Gunnar Nelson to brown belt in cage after a victory as well. Um, you've been talking a lot about how you're a martial artist and this is prize fighting, you're in and out. What does that mean to you to get promoted to brown belt after a victory? 100%. It's, a, it's an honor. Like, prize fighting is short. Get in, get rich, get out. <laughs> but martial arts is a way of life. It's for life. And I've been with John since day one. So for John to give me a brown belt on a night where we did not grapple one bit, I am honored. How good does that? How good does that mean I must be? I didn't even grapple to get a brown belt. I must be the best brown belt on earth. And just from that, speaking of, you said you enjoy money. You made over one thousand eight hundred disclosed dollars per second tonight in your performance. And um, from the guy who celebrated. How do you know what I made? Disclosed. Uh, your new contract was seventy-five thousand to fight, seventy-five thousand to win, and fifty. Don't you talk about my money, yeah? <laughs> Don't ever just, talk about my money. You don't know what I make, yeah? Just after 60 Gs in Sweden, it was your quote for the time. That must sound incredible to you tonight. I'm living good. What can I say? I'm over here. It's a beautiful thing. I'm going to sit back and I'm going to wait for the next couple of days till the pay-per-view numbers come out. I know I, I know I have the Irish support back in me. And I know this was my show. You know, there's some phenomenal athletes. Mighty Mouse is, to me, Mighty Mouse is one of the top pound-for-pound pound martial artists out there at the minute. But I, I, have no, I have no doubt that it was me bringing in the numbers. So I'm going to sit back and I'm going to keep an ear out for what the numbers have been, what them pay-per-view numbers have been. I'm not on the pay-per-view uh, slot just yet, but I will be very soon. So I'm definitely interested to see what the numbers are. And hopefully they are a high number. And hopefully un Uncle Frank, again, shout out Uncle Frank, looks after me. Connor, Connor. Connor, you're right. you stated in your post-fight press conference that you believe the majority of mixed martial artists are sort of basic in their movement. If we assume that after tonight's performance you, you replace um, Dustin at number five, those above you in the rankings, you know, would you categorize those in the same way? For example, Jose Aldo, obviously, who's considered one of the pound-for-pound -pound best. Yeah, de definitely. I've spoke before. I believe Jose is in a situation where they have got to a stage where they are happy with their level. And now it's about maintenance. Now it's about showing up at the gym and getting rounds on rounds, miles on miles on the road. It's about maintenance. And then throughout wars in the gym, wars in the octagon, your body deteriorates. It's not about growth anymore. It's about maintenance. And that is what I feel has happened with Jose. And that is what I feel was what has happened with a lot of these people. That is why I feel I am different than these people. Um, again, at the end of the day, I have respect for everyone in there. But it's business. I'm out to get in, get rich, and get out. You know what I mean? So I have no problem getting in and eliminating these people and carry on, uh, carrying on my journey. But I, res I respect everyone. You know, I... I it, honestly, it took me back a little bit when Dustin was like, "I hate this guy." I can't. I was laughing my head off. I was like, "What? How could you hate a guy?" On, on we're we're on the same thing. We're all making money here. You know what I mean? We're all making money here doing this, chasing this dream. So that baffled me. But I I hate no one. But at the end of the day, business is business is business. It's never personal. It can be cruel. It can be ruthless. But it is never personal. So one by one, I will eliminate the rest of them and uh, and make all my money and get out. And then, who knows, maybe I'll teach them a thing or two on, the, on my journey. We'll take two more questions. Dana, um, such a long battle to get Eddie Alvarez to the UFC. How did you write his performance tonight? Yeah, I mean, Eddie, Eddie is a tough guy. I mean, he took serious punishment to the leg. He took, he took knees to the body that a lot of people can't take. He took some great head shots. You know, um, you know, I don't want to take anything away from the guy, but, you know, I, I got to say, you know, this kid's out wakeboarding every day. This kid's out wakeboarding every day this week. Drives me crazy. And uh, has anybody here ever spent a day at the lake or the beach? 
You know how you feel when you come back from the lake or the beach after a day at the beach? This guy did it every day. He drives me nuts. Um, you know, he is who he is and he does what he does. It's part of the fun. He's incredibly talented and can do a million different things. But I, I can't stand that he rock climbs, wakeboards, and bull rides the week of the fucking fight. So, anyway, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's my answer. And question for Dominic. <clears throat> it seems like next for you is going to be a title shot. How do you think that you match up with TJ Dillashaw? I think I match up great with anybody in the division. You know, nothing but respect for, for everybody in the division, but I never really lost my title. Um, I got hurt, and I haven't been sitting around eating getting fat, doing nothing. I've been working, and I've, I've been analyzing fights, breaking them down, learning about everybody in the division, everybody's style, watching people take bits and pieces of the things that I talk about and make it their, their own. And I'm watching the sport evolve, and I'm watching people grow and get better. And I'm with them. I haven't just been sitting around. I'm ready to go out there and have that belt. I never lost it. I shouldn't have gone in anybody else's hands, but I was hurt. It's my own doing, so I just want to go prove that I'm still there. How much of the preparation coming into this fight was about the mental game and getting the confidence back in your knee? 100% of it is mental. Everything I did was mental. That's all it was. It's a mental game. It's a mental three years of hell. But you either make it or you break. And I had to make it. And I had to do something tonight to prove that I wouldn't break. And I felt like I went in there and broke somebody else to let that be known. And just one quick one for Connor. There were the rumors leading up to the fight that you'd hurt your hand. You said that you'd torn some ligaments after the fight. How much of an impact did that have on your pre preparation? And was it ever a thought to pull out of the fight? Um, <clears throat> yeah, of course, it, it, it affects preparation. My thumb was swollen, like it was like a little foot. It was like a little football coming out of my thumb. I couldn't grip, and I certainly couldn't punch. But again, for this was about four or five weeks before the fight. I just simply improvised, adapted, and overcame. We can talk about Cole Miller. My previous opponent, seven weeks, seven weeks before UFC main event, a big, a big event, he pulled out seven weeks because of torn ligaments in his thumb. And I couldn't understand that. So when it happened to me four weeks out, I just, I, I knew I was going to overcome it. And, and that is what I've done. I have a bulletproof mind. There's not a lot that can break me. And I, I, I again, it's just a thumb. It's just a tom. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. And that is what I've done. Of course, you have these little bat battles with your head. You can't make a fist. You know, when you squeeze your fist and it hurts, it's like there's definitely doubt there. But I came out here to Las Vegas two weeks beforehand, enjoyed the sunshine. The sunshine gave me a little boost. And I just, that actually got me to that next. Because we, we don't have sunshine back home. You know, we just have darkness back home. So when I came out and got this boost of vitamin D two weeks before the fight, although I was having some sort of doubt in my head, I was like, this is unbelievable. I love this shit. Now, you know, I'm just, just going to wrap it up and swing it hard, and, that, and that's, that's what I've done. You know what he told me? You don't need a tom to fight. <laughs> that's what he told me. I said, is it true you hurt your hand? No, you don't need a tom to fight. I said, okay. Um, question for, for Connor. You called your shot tonight, uh, so I'll ask you the question. Obviously, I know it's – pressure in your head, but Jose Aldo, Chad Mendez, how do you call your shot against those two if you face the winner of that fight? Um, how does that fight go, or how do I fare against him? How do you fare against him? I, I believe I'll dismantle both of them. Chad's a five foot six, overblown. You know, he's a, he, he should be a 135, but he's gone past that limit now. Now he's just a little small bodybuilder that's stuck in the 145 division. He gets tired quick. Um... He's five foot six, five foot five, sixty-five inch reach. I have an eight-inch reach advantage on him. I will tower over him. So I would maul Chad. And um, Jose, again, I feel he's in that pattern of deterioration. Um, so again, another another easy win. I, I, it seems to be, the division seems to be full of rookies and has-beens. So I'm just sitting here, enjoying myself, collecting these checks on my way, eliminating each one. And uh, a question for Demetrius. Uh, congrats on the on the win once again. You have five in a row, five title defenses in a row. You're not you're not a you're not a trash talker. It's not your way or anything. But are there challenges still left for you at flyweight? I mean, I know John Dawson's out for a while. He's probably not going to come back till next year. But are there still challenges at 125 for you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, for me, I always want to go out there and put on the perfect fight, and that's a challenge itself. You know, I'm fighting the best guys in the world in the division, 
And for me, you know, just because, you know, a lot of people out there didn't give Chris Carriasco recognition, but I trained like he was the best fighter in the world. So for me, there's always challenges out there, and that's for me to be a perfect mixed martial artist. And I know you had said that uh, this fight was came a little soon after your last one. Do you intend on taking a pretty decent break after this and, and not coming back till pretty deep into 2015? Or what are your thoughts? Because obviously this one, this one went pretty quick for you. He's fighting in December. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, I was like, oh, 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 Dana, 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 let's not go that route now. Um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm going to take off some time. You know, I'm taking all of October off. Then I'm going to start training, you know, no November, December. Then hopefully we get back to work, you know, January, February, you know. So uh, the first year of 2014, you know, I, I had a long layoff. You know, I didn't fight till June. And then I had a quick turnaround. I was supposed to fight August 30th. If I would have fought August 30th, I would have took September off, then possibly fight in December. But that boat's done shipped and sailed. Now I'm just going to relax and get back to work, hopefully January, February. Cool. Thank you guys very much. We appreciate your support. Have a good night.